Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So it's amazing. At first, the government's sitting there trying to um, win the hearts and minds of Italians by reinventing their children's palettes, right? Mm. And then in the post-war period, uh, those same kind of organizations, and I'm thinking specifically in New York City, where they had a very strong um, outreach program, that same organization is then using spaghetti, Italian spaghetti to hmm. teach um, teaching to Puerto Rican immigrants. And they're right. trying to to indoctrinate a, in, in essentially in reverse and saying, look, this is a, an affordable meal. You should you should eat it. The Italians hmm. did it. And now they're American, you know, and that was sort of the um, sort of implication that was happening is the government was was at first don't eat spaghetti. And then it was like it became a tool of the state, essentially. Yes, to, yes. Um, and you know, I think propaganda, that, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think I think it's like a really interesting uh, way of looking at it, especially when you um, in in contemporary times, or, or you know, you have friends who talk about their ethnic foods they would bring to lunch and how they were made fun of for whatever it was, right. whether whether it was a kimchi or mm. you know uh, you know some of the other ethnicities that have come into America uh, in more recent times. Mm -hmm. uh, and and they were made to feel bad about that ethnic food, and I'm sure in, in 20 or 30 years we are, have all those delicious foods as part of the exactly. the mainstay diet, you know, the American lexicon, the American mm -hmm. menu for sure. Yeah, so you know, so we talked a lot. So towards the end, it really like of the book, you really focus on some of the individual, um, you know, the veal parmesan, the mm -hmm. fra, fra diavolo, the lobster diavolo. Mm -hmm. um, towards the beginning, you know, I you 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 hooked me right away. The there's the uh, opening with your mom you know, being the great cook and she's talking <laughs> spaghetti with your, I guess, kind of, with a quote unquote blue blood, your future. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Her future mother-in-law and it's the whole yeah. throwing of the wall, throwing, throwing spaghetti. the pasta against the wall. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, this is a story that my mother has repeated many different ways over the years, <laughs> but basically that her first time meeting her future mother-in-law was um, let's make some pasta for the little Italian girl. And and you know, taking the the pasta out of the thing and throwing it against the wall, and my mother said, and my my grandmother then said to her, "That's how you know it's done when it sticks, right?" And then and then my mother says, "No, we usually taste it." Right? <laughs> and um, so I I assume it's, it's some variation of that is true. I've heard it <laughs> enough from my mother. Um, but yeah, and I and I think that it, it's interesting is by that point that was the late sixties, early seventies, so. There at that point, Italian food is pretty well integrated into American right. mainstream culture, and it, it's kind of a an ah uh, an oddity at that point. Um, yeah, but um, you know, yeah. where the to me one of the sort of golden ages of red sauce is actually the nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, you're you're at a point where you know uh, people went to Italy during the war, they came back. You have nationalization of things like lasagna. You can get the Stouffer's lasagna is introduced in the fifties, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they had a whole line of casseroles, and the only one that was any any good was the lasagna, or, and <laughs> uh, which is saying a lot, given that it's not necessarily that great. Um, yeah, not to malign Stouffer's. Uh, I mean, actually, the podcast is sponsored by by Stouffer's, so can we erase? Yeah. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and then and, and pizza really takes off of that period too, and. Um, what's really interesting in the 1950s is is seeing how Americans just did not they couldn't pronounce these things hmm. to the point where um, multiple issues of um, what I describe as women's magazines I was able to find them in the New York Public Library under the there's a, a database of what they call women's magazines microfiche um, no so I, <laughs> the beauty of the digital age is, yeah, is yeah, yeah. digitization um, you know. It, this project would have been impossible on microfiche because you mm. would have had, I would have been going to libraries around the country and still not finding all the right, things. Right, right. Um, but in the magazines, they have pronunciation guides for pizza and lasagna. Oh, wow. And then they also describe how you should have it. So there's one, uh, there was a pizza party, right? I think it was like a uh, a teenager magazine, like you, early 17 or one of okay. those um, targeting uh, teen girls. It's like, this is how you have a pizza party. You know, you like, you can make it, right? You know, um, had an assembly instructions how to make sauce but they you know it included this is how you pronounce this weird word huh. um but you know 
it, it also dovetailed, I think, really nicely with a movement in the 1950s towards convenience, right? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the whole, and this is actually where my my blue blooded grandmother probably benefited is open a can and dump dump a food into <laughs> a bowl and you have a meal, right? Um, and she, the Irish side did not cook a, a whole lot, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so pizza as a takeout food, right? It it. What a great concept! You you drive up you in your car. You know people in the fifties loved loved their cars. They drive right. drive yeah, to the yeah, pizzeria, yeah. pick up the pizza, and and drive it home. And now you have a a, a whole meal for however much a, a pizza cost back then. Mm. Um, and you know I I think one of the great Italian American heroes who I don't even think he's Italian <laughs> was this guy Ira Nevin from Westchester County, New York. He was um the son of uh bricklayers essentially they were people mm. who made um uh ovens and then but he was an a, a aeronautical engineer and so he goes into the military he has his background in building ovens he has his background in aeronautical engineering he, he eats some pizza while he's in italy he comes back and is like let me invent the gas fired uh pizza mm. oven and this is a revolution so in in america between 1910 and and the war um if you wanted a pizza well first of all you probably didn't know you did want it because it was uh-huh. only localized in a few italian american neighborhoods sure. um in new haven and new york and and trenton um the only way to do that was it was a coal fired oven basically maybe you had some wood ovens but coal was cheaper in the united states and it was this big bread oven that you got hot with coal you put your pizza in and two minutes later you had a pizza the problem is with a pizza oven like that is if you ever let it get cold, and I mean truly cold, where there's no embers at all, it can take a day or two to get hot again, right? Whoa. It can get it, 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 the the moisture that that um, the condensation that forms as it cools can be a problem. So what you need to be doing is you need to have a fire in there every day, mm. and so that is its own challenge to maintain. Sure. And then it's, and then at the same time, you're shoveling, constantly shoveling coal or wood into the, into the oven. That's very labor intensive. So Iron Evans gas fired oven, the pizza oven changes the, the ability to basically buy the machine, put it in the back of a, of a commercial kitchen and mm. turn out pizzas. Right. Mm. And now you're, you're not necessarily going to be doing it quite as quickly as a coal, coal oven. It still gets very hot. Yeah. Um, but that, that's when you really see the ability for, um, for pizzerias just to become on every street corner yeah. and certainly certainly new york by the you know the 70s you have rays and famous rays and all the mm-hmm. other rays pizzas mm-hmm. and um and then in the 50s and 60s you start getting um uh, bars essentially are starting to open up with pizzerias and this is how you get detroit style pizza this is how yeah. you get deep dish pizza this is how you get domino's and pizza hut and um papa john's a little bit later uh, Little Caesars is the other the other big one from the fifties. Oh, yeah, right, right, are all right. Midwestern chains that um, I guess not all of them started in bars, but m- a lot of them just were mm. a guy who sort of knew someone who maybe had an Italian relative who could give him a recipe for a base of pizza, and you know a lot of them had had it in 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 Italy during the war or um, at, in New York when they were transitioning through um, mm. on their way to Europe, and. Um, yeah, so that this is this is all because of the gas fired oven, basically. Yeah. You, you would not have pizza every you would not have a pizza hut on every corner if they were shoveling coal into the oven to keep it hot, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you know, pizza huts on every corner. The the first chapter, again, you you hooked me. You have the the great scene with uh talking about the Sopranos. Oh. <laughs> uh, right. So we got yeah. uh, Polly Walnuts and, and Big Pussy at the coffee shop, and it's yep. like, you know, Polly you know, it's just gesticulating everywhere and bemoaning all the exploitation <laughs> and, you know, they're making all this money off us and espresso yep. and cappuccino. You have that great cut to the trip to Italy. It's a, I think, I mean, it's a different episode. Yeah. But uh, he's I like, the right. Second season. Yeah. But and he's he... like Jersey shore Italian, right. Where mm-hmm, he, like mm-hmm. when they went over to Italy and they spoke like, you know, he, he spoke it like, it's like a very antiquated couple words. Mm-hmm. he asked for like you know spaghetti and gravy macaroni and gravy and they're like what yeah. are you talking about right mm-hmm. well gravy is a really interesting lexicon oh, yeah. element right so um, Can of worms a, right there a lot of people basically the first question at literally every event is oh, i used to call it gravy why did not you call it red gravy or, or gravy uh-huh. and um which is a, a valid question in some respects in that you can translate 
ragu to gravy, right? Okay. Um, you also have salsa, right? In Italian, you also have um, sugo. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, and so these are all variations of the idea of sauce, a a sauce for your your mm. meat or your your pasta. Now, um, where you came from in Italy, and then where you settled in America, determined your use of that word. So right. some people call it all gravy. Some people call it all sauce. Mm. But within that, you also have uh, gravy or Sunday sauce, which would refer yeah. to specifically what you make on Sunday filled with meat. Right. And then sauce would come to mean anything that didn't have meat, which would be more typical on your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday kind of meals. Okay. Um, but the Sunday sauce, the gravy was really like all of your Italian relatives, which, you know, is the first generation was everyone who lives in your apartment building and everyone who lives on your block is related to you. And they're all coming over for Sunday dinner. Right. And so what do you do? You're going to put all this meat into a big red sauce. You're going to let it cook for a couple hours and, and then you serve it. And, uh, and that's gravy or sauce or Sunday sauce for a lot of people yeah. um, with these variations. And, and, you know, and then going back to what you're saying about the Sopranos, this is what Polly Walnuts is asking for in Naples is he mm -hmm. wants he wants gravy and the guy was like oh he doesn't know what he's talking about because you know no one in italy would you like the translation from ragu to gravy and then back is a little bit more difficult of a leap right it's like when you put a phrase into google translate and you go through a bunch of languages and you yeah. come up with a totally different telephone game um no and, and so that's what he he's sort of reacting to and i think that is that is something younger people um don't necessarily have anymore right mm. we, we live in an age where jet travel is very easy where a lot of people go to italy they and if they haven't been to italy they've probably watched food food network yeah and um they've watched stanley uh, tucci or something right yeah oh absolutely stanley tucci is a great example of that he he's is. um you know touring through some of the most beautiful uh peace parts of the world um of italy right there and, and talking about that food that isn't necessarily recognizable or is like a distant shadow of what we grew up with. Yeah. Um, and actually, so I have, I've just read his memoir and he talks about that in, um, like I said, in growing up his, his ethnic food that he would bring to school, he oh. always wanted to change trade it as a kid for a fluff nutter sandwich. Right. Oh, because yeah. Right. And, but you know, the, you know, this is the sort of challenge of, of a very ethnically Italian American is, is your children want the fluff or nutter sandwich, right? Um, and now that we're in a, in a period where we're two or three generations removed from that, yep. um, you you have a different interpretation of of and different expectation of what you're going to eat. You know? No doubt about it. After the that part, you you transition into you know really interesting. Like it really does encapsulate basically your book is like the story of like Olive Garden and like was it Starboard mm -hmm. is like the consulting. Oh firm. yeah, so there's this um. This is a really fascinating thing that was 10, 10 years ago ish, where a venture capital firm was trying to oust the uh, ownership control, the conglomerate that owned Olive Garden. So they had some other restaurants in there too. But they, uh, you know, as happens with a hostile takeover, they were trying to make an argument that they would be a better uh, management company for. Um, that the conglomerate and one of their big targets was how badly Olive Garden was managed. And so in this PowerPoint, they outline all the mistakes that are happening in the Olive Garden, not putting salt water in the pasta, mm -hmm. in, you know, mm -hmm. or not putting salt in the pasta water tisk, uh, is tisk, one example. Tisk. Yeah. But then they, they also like to use the term authenticity. Sure. And this is to me, part of it is they were talking about, we want Olive Garden to be more authentic. Right. But then they propose a bunch of dishes that have literally nothing to do with with Italian food or modern Italian food, including a vegetarian bolognese sauce. Right. Which mm. sounds great, but it's not it's like an oxymoron. Bolognese sauce, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And um, so I use that as a jumping off point to talk about authenticity and what that means. But I think I'm not going to defend Olive Garden as good, but I <laughs> would defend it as um as some kind of American authenticity, right? This is truly American food in the worst possible way, perhaps. But, um, you know, uh, you know what you're getting into when you go to Olive Garden. Exactly. It's available everywhere in America. And in a way, it's brought 
Italian American influence dishes to people who would never have had Italian American food. And, and you could say this about any kind of chain in any kind of ethnicity. Is PF Chang's great Chinese food? I right. I've only been there once or twice, but you know, it is an interpretation of American food, mm -hmm. widely available everywhere in America, right? Yeah. And so maybe it's just a good interpretation of American food, which I think is maybe also fine to say about Olive Garden. Um, you know, we're never going to be able to replicate true Italian food in America because just the basic quality of food is going to be different, right? They mm -hmm. have rules and regulations that are part of the EU that dictate what you're allowed to put into milk and cheese and and, sure. and fruits and vegetables. And we have a different set of regulations. And, and we can argue all day about what is the correct way of approaching that, but it's simply going to be a different system one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also, I, I typically take issue with, uh, so there's uh, the uh, True Pizza Association. I forget the exact, it's AVPN. It's yeah. the uh, Neapolitan Pizza Association that, right. that gives uh, certificates of uh, authenticity to pizzerias, right? It's uh, You can buy into the system, but it's basically saying these are the authentically Neapolitan pizzas. So there's a margarita and then there's two other uh, variations of that that technically qualify. Yeah. So the... The big thing that they do with that is they require you to use um, San Marzano tomatoes from San Marzano area, but they have to be certified. So uh, you can't just get tomatoes grown in that area that are San Marzano's. They have to literally be certified. Hmm. But you also must be using um, uh, buffalo mozzarella cheese right. that is from Italy. So the the at the the first thing that's happening here, if you're in New York, there's a couple of the certified pizzerias. If you're making the um, margarita pizza, you're bringing in canned San Marzano tomatoes and you're flying buffalo mozzarella halfway around the world just to qualify, right? Hmm. But that's not that's not the ethos of Italian of authentic Italian sure. food. The ethos of Italian food is what what Local, do you get in the market? Right? You walk into the market and some guy picked the vegetables and produce in the field that afternoon and you or that morning and you bought it that afternoon and you made dinner with it. Right? You're not flying mm -hmm. it around the world. And I think to me, that is, is one of the, the conflicts here, right? Yeah. Like if you want authentic Italian food, go to Italy. If you want <laughs> if you want authentic Italian American food, you're here. You're you know, eat it here. Sure. Um and uh and so I, I think it's it's incorrect to sort of lean really heavily on the idea of authenticity. Yeah. I think maybe a, a, a better term, if you're like, I want a uh, contemporary flavors from Italy is to say a modern Italian restaurant. Yes. Um, yes. Because, you know, it's the age we live in. And this is the other thing, food is constantly changing and evolving, right? You know, and I think this is the narrative that I tell in Red Sauce is right. The, the Italian American recipes in 1905, 1910, um, they're not what you eat at a red sauce joint today. The mm. penne alla vodka was not invented until the 60s, right? right. But it's everywhere now, right? Mm -hmm. um, pasta and, primavera, and, right? Yeah. Well, and so pasta primavera is a, my my favorite example. And to me, the, the indicator of the end of the red sauce era, because mm. it's a, an Italianized dish invented at, in Long Island or on Long Island. Like a French restaurant, for, no? For a French restaurant. Yeah. And then, and then that that re that recipe is incredible that original recipe is two pages of ingredients mm -hmm. right before you even get to the instructions <laughs> and um and per uh was it le cirque le cirque that uh introduced it and it was an amazing um dish at the time but then rapidly replicated i mean i certainly remember in the early 1980s in the tri-state area every italian restaurant in america mm -hmm. or in that in that region yeah. had a primavera dish of some kind none of them were going to be the up to the original and certainly none of them were truly italian right so this is yeah. not not uh, you know uh the the term uh comes from the the painting not from you mm. know springtime right um and so yeah i i think that's like a really interesting the evolution of these things now does that yeah. make pasta primavera not good no i think you can probably find great examples i think you have a lot of bad examples of it right you go to mm -hmm. your local corner pizzeria who didn't bother reading that two pages of 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 uh of ingredients and just threw in whatever frozen vegetables they had into <laughs> a, a cream sauce is probably not exactly uh going to be the best pasta primavera you've ever had exactly. and certainly you know the olive garden probably has a version i, I don't know if they do I, I wouldn't 
you know, they, they're famous for adulterating these things, like their carbonara recipe, right? They've taken, uh, or not, uh, I'm sorry, their Alfredo recipe, right? Yeah. Uh, Alfredo yeah. sauce is butter and cheese. It's a lot of butter and a lot of cheese and, you know, extra eggs in the pasta, but that that's the basic recipe from 120 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, the Olive uh, Garden. Me, go ahead. There's so there's an Olive Garden version where, uh, yeah, I, it comes across because they you know they do promos, so they they have their Olive Garden chef go on TV and they give you the <laughs> recipe, right? And this is where you find out how how they make it. They add cream, they add milk, they add multiple kinds of cheese to, to increase the viscosity, right? And all of a sudden, that I mean, that's not Alfredo anymore. That's no, you know this, you know. Uh, I don't know, a white sauce with cheese, right? Exactly. It's okay if you like it, but it's just, it's not, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. It's not, yeah. Yeah. The, you do, you know, talk about, you know, evolution and you do such a great job tracing the evolution of the Italian Americans, you know, like mm -hmm. so many other ethnic groups with, um, like you talk about, you know, kind of like exoticism and the mm -hmm. garlic and the pungency and what is this stuff to, you know, World War II and, you know, Boyardee and the canned foods, <laughs> some of the things you've already talked about, right? And then I, what I thought was so interesting too was you know the idea of the cucina povera, the mm -hmm. poor man's food, if you will, and the cucina ricci. When the Italians got here and started to get more wealth, you know, the immigrants, they were kind of like imitating their wealth, and that's yeah. you know one of the many, not not the only one of the many factors that led to, um, you know, like the red sauce culture, mm -hmm. and then like the whole like I don't know cyclical or coming back to home plate type of thing with like in more recent years, like Northern Italian now is considered kind of more authentic. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a, a weird evolution and this is partly a, a change in the, in the immigration right. um, that happened after World War II. So, you know, after World War II, all of Italy is devastated. The North is particularly devastated because they were an industrial hub. Mm. Right. And, and so like most of Europe, industry was not doing well after the war because of all the bombing. You know, if you were at war, you bombed industrial centers so you couldn't make munitions, right? Um, and so uh, before the boom, which is the economic miracle of the, the 60s, I think it is in Italy. Boom. Il, boom. Il boom, right? <laughs> um, you you had you had Italians who were starving and, and who didn't have jobs and a good way of, you know, solving that was to leave. Um, which much in the same reason that Southern Italians left in the, yeah. in the, from 1880 to the second world war is, is searching for food and a better life. Um, that, that it simply just shifted who was coming. Right. Um, and, and not to say that Southern Italians weren't coming after the war, but, uh, the, the ratio of, of Southern to a Northern kind of balanced out a little bit more. Um, and actually the interesting thing is, um, a number of people, after the war came to America and then went back. And now right. in the early, in the early 19th or the early 20th century and late 19th century, a lot of Italians intended to come to America, make some money and come back. Most of them did not. Some of them did, but most of them did not. Sure. But the, but after the war, it was a lot more um, going back and forth. Um, and the, the, to me, the amazing thing today is you go into a little Italy neighborhood and you're probably going to come across people who were born in Italy who are 20 or 30 years old, right? Um, doesn't doesn't matter necessarily where they came from in Italy, but if they're in a little Italy in, in, like New York or Baltimore and Boston, they're plugged into a community that is making red sauce. And a lot of them are making, are, uh, you know, a, a kitchen help or, or waiter, wait staff um, is a great job opportunity for a new immigrant, right? Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, um, you know, particularly if you're within an ethnic enclave, you're hiring someone's cousin to come work at your your restaurant, right? Um, and so you have these people who are coming from Northern Italy or from Central Italy who are cooking traditional red sauce in these traditional red sauce joints hmm. in Little Italy's. And they're essentially adding credibility to the red sauce, <laughs> even though it's probably something they had no idea how to cook before they got here. Yeah. And um, and I think it's actually, you know, there are a lot of immigrant groups who have um, that kind of network. You know, I think of um, Chinese restaurants in America where, uh, you know, immigrants arrive in a Chinatown. There's uh, the Chinatown buses are a network of buses that were designed to connect both Chinatown communities in different places, but also to get um, new immigrants to Chinese restaurants across all across America mm -hmm. to help 
facilitate, you know, uh, cre- provide labor, but also to create uh, a community support. Right. But essentially, you're getting people who have no idea how to cook Chinese American food mm. uh, coming to these restaurants and then learning what American food is. And I think, you know, um, I, I believe it's Jennifer Aitley that talks about it in uh, Fortune Cookie Chronicles. Uh, the American uh, fortune cookie exported back to China. Yes. As a, right? yes. And, you know, and I feel like we actually do have that happening in America now, right? Um, so Penny Alla Vodka, great example of this, is invented in New York, exported back to Italy in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a favorite. So Italy didn't really have a vodka culture until the 1960s and 1970s when vodka companies started introducing it to bars, right? Um, but, you know, 70s, you know, discotheques were a big popular way of partying. Uh, apparently by the 70s, they started serving penny alla vodka or, or a, a vodka sauce over pasta in a lot of these discotheques. And many multiple people have told me uh, their experiences of doing that in the 70s and early 80s, where they would go clubbing and then penny alla vodka was on the menu, was the, huh. the memory they have. Um, and so I think that is fascinating is that we're, we're actually inspiring or changing Italian cuisine by exporting the, these Italian American yeah. dishes to them. Um, and then, you know, and then you also have like American food, right? Um, a good example is uh, Lydia Basanovich, who, you know, has a restaurant empire in America and, mm-hmm. and a cooking show on, I think, PBS um, and many, many cookbooks about Italian food. Um, and she is from the North. She's from a region of Italy that's not always been part of Italy even. Right, exactly. Right. And uh, and so she was probably instrumental in uh, in introducing Americans to like, um a lot of uh, nor- northern what we helping us understand a northern cuisine uh, as well as marcello hazan who yeah also very famously uh not from the south but um her lydia's restaurant there's a restaurant that she has in in italy that serves americanized food right and so she's exporting things like cheeseburgers to italians um <laughs> and and that i think is a really great uh you know the the back and forth right where yes you know so just just as long as you don't mix seafood and cheese the italians will be okay well but then you have yeah. shrimp shrimp parm right i know i know you I have know. to have shrimp parm simplified during Lent. Yeah. yes 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 <laughs> the um you know i mean arguably like kind of like the the thesis of the book is um and man you're a heck of a writer this is straight from your words Quote, red sauce is a distinct cuisine invented through the confluence of Italian immigration, the bounty of the expanding American economy, and the unique cultural interactions between disparate ethnic groups in early 20th century American cities. It is also the story of impoverished peasants improvising and reinventing to imitate lifestyles they could have only dreamed of in their native country. And in the process, they create the, these beloved foods while integrating into mainstream society. This is the story of red sauce. And we need like somebody with like a deep, deep baritone <laughs> voice for that. But, but, you know, like, I mean, some of the things we've talked about and you talk about in the book, like they could be interchangeable for any culture, but mm-hmm. I just think, you know, you make some really strong points that you've talked about, like, you know, the bounty, that difference between yeah. like, you know, meet once a week or once a month and, you know, have it every day. The and then, and then, of, go ahead. Well, in the 19th century and even in the probably early 20th century, most of the times who came here, mm-hmm. if they, if they had meat, um, once a year, that was a big deal. Right now, now I'm. I would say I think in that statement, there are certain meats that they have more access to that we don't think about, like rabbit. So, like my grandfather, for instance, raised rabbits and ate rabbit pretty regularly. Oh, I and had some rabbit in Italy. I had some rabbit in, in Tuscany, Luca. A, it was so good. It's a great meat. We should be uh, eating more of it. It's very lean. It's very mm-hmm. much like a, a red meat. Um, but essentially, though, if you know, if you're talking about beef and you're talking about pork, like meat you know big m meat Mm -hmm. um those things were much more readily available in the united states um and 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 people had never really had access to it on on a large scale if they did it was maybe as sausages it was uh and then with sausages you can squeeze in a bunch of other stuff in there right Mm. you can have cheaper fillers you can use organ meats um and and you know in a the breadcrumbs in was way, a great point too oh yeah oh yeah right? breadcrumbs extended everything you know you could uh toss breadcrumbs on pasta carb on carb breadcrumbs on pasta yeah. right it makes it a heartier meal which is actually you know, they're they're delicious they a little salt a little um and if you do it right when you serve 
you're you're um you're creating a little texture there um also you put salt uh put it in sauce breadcrumbs and sauce because that mm. would increase the volume you're also a great way to not waste old day old bread or two day old bread right yeah um and you know this is i think a fascinating thing is is with like a veal parm is bread and fried right um you know, another way of using up those hmm. day old bread. Um, yeah, but, you know, to the larger point of like, how do they come up, concoct these ideas is, is you know, most people who were immigrating before 1920 were people who had never eaten in a restaurant, right? They, they might have had, um, you know, like a, a f- equivalent of a food truck, right? Yeah. Uh, and actually, technically, I guess in Naples, they had uh, uh, the mobile pizza truck was actually yeah. thing. you got little guys pushing around carts with, with pizzas in it. But, you know, for the most part, you didn't eat at a formal restaurant at all. Um, you cooked what you had at home. And, and so suddenly you have money to spend and you're like, oh, like, what what should I make? What what does this look like? And And, you know, definitely. Oh, and then the other thing is if you don't have a literate population, it's very hard to pass down recipes mm. um, that way as well, because you, know, you need to be able to read. Um, and they, that changes over time. You know, uh, fascist Italy in the 1920s and 30s was pushing a lot of things like literacy, Italian as a national language, which is another challenging element in, in 1880, is what, if you had a cookbook, what language would it be in? Would it be in dialect? Would it be in, in Italian? Would it be in in spanish right you know mm. parts of italy had had just been ruled by spain um you know german another one in, in mm. the northern end yeah so uh just the idea of like who's who what language would you even be reading and even if you could read and who would be publishing those books is, is, a, is a challenge until much later um which is you know in, in the 1950s we get um some really uh iconic books and then even uh pellegrino artuzzi has a very iconic book in the 19th century um the uh art and science of eating well yeah uh, the, yeah and and that is a really great example of like combining a lot of these recipes one of the early english cookbooks is actually just like a knockoff translation of, of his mm-hmm. book um and that's the other thing you start seeing is is books that get translated into english um in the 20th century you start having the the injection of Italian American uh, recipes, which is really fascinating. So, like uh, one Ada Boni's book, one of the early translations, uh, which is probably due for a modern translation, as far as I can tell. Um, Get on it. But, yeah, <laughs> I'm not that good enough of a translation. <laughs> a little more Duolingo. Yeah, but the uh, the um, the the versions I could find from the 1950s have Italian American recipes in it, right? Uh, spaghetti meatballs, for instance. And then a, another thing that happens in, in these kind of cookbooks is uh, the decision by the editor or, or, or author to um, anglicize the name of a dish or to keep it as, as an Italianized name with, with uh, mm-hmm. you know, the ingredients in English, obviously. Um, and then, you know, why, why was that decision made? And that, that was one, you know, it's probably a whole another book about you know lexicon yeah. of, of cookbooks but um you know that begins to change over time too is so they become first very english focused and then you start reverting back to sort of like uh melazuna for eggplant and you know like uh, you know using those those kinds of terms so huh well you know congrats on uh you published a book. It has your name on it. Congrats on the book that yeah, you know you add you. into added to food studies, added to the cultural studies, you know, discussion. Very interesting. Very um, so many interesting stories. You know, the the Pickfords, the Hollywood connection. <laughs> you know, World War II. Um, like we talk about, like that cyclical thing of like of authenticity, and you know, mm-hmm. that Olive Garden story really just is is so it's such a microcosm of you know who's who's saying what's authentic and not and what does that yep. mean and you know that changing that slippery slope what any you know any brooklyn any local places we should buy the book and you know online any recommendations you might have so uh the in uh, on cape cod in the uh east end books uh i did an event there over the summer i think they had a couple books left on hand uh if not i believe it's still available at bookshop.org okay uh, yeah and 
there is an Italian American bookshop in in Boston called I Am Books that mm. regularly has it available. Uh, that's a great shop. They um they opened a, a while ago, but they have a new location. It's about a year old. Um, the the owner came from Italy and uh, just decided to open an Italian American bookshop. They do a lot of events, uh, and you know, they they featured my book in their uh, yeah. in their advertisements before and on their Twitter. So I'm always happy to send people there. Um, yeah, so it very cool, and you can always order it from your your local bookseller uh, if if they don't have it in stock, and and that would be great too. And a lot of public libraries have it too. So um, very cool. Yeah. It's um, you know, it's it's very topical for now for you know, um, you know, Americanization, melting pot, all those words you want to say, whether they have negative mm -hmm. or positive connotations for you. It's got a lot of great history in there as well. So we got. You know, De Niro's got family from Campo Basso and Molise, and then there's Ian McAllen. Great, <laughs> great Molis, Molisani, I guess you would say, right? Yeah. <laughs> Congrats. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats on the great book, um, you know, which is right over your left shoulder there. Go, yep. go If you're listening, go get Red Sauce. Um, there it is with that <laughs> iconic chef, right? I, you know, I do love that chef. Yes. That was uh, what I, you know, uh, when you're, before you've written a book, you know, they, they always tell you that, you know, you have no control over your, your mm -hmm. cover, your, the press is going to cover all that. And they'll, they'll dictate to you what you're going to have on there. But it was, it was great to have that experience where I, um, they asked for some suggestions. I sent them a bunch of book covers. They came back with four and they said, choose. And I was like torn between, uh, the little chef that we have back here. And this other one that was just like a little bit more modern looking, but uh, this is a, a book about retro things and yeah. the little chef is a great little icon and he's been my partner this whole time nice. everywhere i go uh a little a little chef with me so exactly it's like now you can't picture the book without that cover yeah, right exactly yeah. exactly I mean, well i want to wish you continued great luck with all of your writing all of the, your different pursuits i know we just you know it's just the tip of the iceberg that you're such a creative yeah person and you know thanks again for for talking to me and talking to us about yeah, Red this Soft. is a lot of fun thank you very much for having me have a great day thank you yeah all right